In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. Uh, we're going to go on with John 6, of course, but I want to also use this first section to reflect more on background, allusion. Some of it will become explicit when we get to the uh, speech, the discourse of Jesus, which is long. Uh, last time, you remember, I talked about the mystery of particularity. God acts here in a way that he doesn't act here. God acts here in this bread and wine, and it becomes the body and blood of Christ. God does not act the, the bread and wine over on the table, and it doesn't become. Now, that's particularity. That's baffling. Only God could do this, because he's the creator. A mind that does not understand transcendence thinks of it as uh, all one color, all one type, all whatever you want, you see? Therefore, you can have somebody as the world government leader. You can have, because reality is all the same and it's not going anywhere. You see what I mean? And so, but it is. Reality has a goal. The goal? Heaven. At a person, certain time, when this march through time, you see, time for us is not just a big container where everything happens, you know. Uh, as uh, uh, St. Augustine said, you see, uh, reality is not in time. Time is in reality. You see, that is... We don't have a big box called time and you can keep putting God creates this and that goes into time. No. See, it's the reality first. That's the great thing. And time is the dimension of that reality. But the reality is bigger than time. As somebody once said, I gave a, I was talking to a group of people and um, some young African-American boys and I said something and one of them said, the one asked me the question, I answered it the other one said, you hear that? That's a big idea he's giving you. Well, I'm giving you a big idea. See, time is not the measure of reality. God's will is. God's action is. At the center of all reality is God's plan to have every human being fall in love with Jesus Christ, live by his body and blood on this in this life, and then live by his total reality, you see, forever. That's God's plan. How come it's not working out? Because we don't obey Him. How many people did you preach to today? You know, when is the whole world going to... When we get going. When we are so in love with Christ that we don't care what happens to us. The world's got to know Him. That force comes from this reality that we're discussing. Chapter 6 of John, the Eucharist. Now, one of the ways of describing this is to talk about kavod, the instance of kavod, which means glory. I want to read, I may have read this before, this is a, a description of kavod by uh, my old doctor father, actually, Father Mola. I'll read it. The expression, the glory of Adonai, means God himself insofar as he is revealed in his majesty, his power, the glow of his holiness, the dynamism of his being. I may read another text which says the same thing in another way. Uh, first, we'll get through this one. The glory of Adonai is therefore epiphanic. God manifests his glory 
by striking interventions. That's the point. Lourdes and 20 miles down the road, not the same. You see, Sinai, not the mountain next door. God gave the law. You see, Abraham, not everybody else in Ur of the Chaldees. You see, it is striking interventions, his judgments, his signs, as Numbers calls them, Book of Numbers. Such, par excellence, is the miracle of the Red Sea. Such also that of the manna and the quail. When you're talking about that, you read in the book of Exodus, in the morning you will see the kavod Adonai. You will see the glory of God, the glory of Adonai. And the second type of divine manifestations, the visible reality is the flashing radiance of the divine being, light. The essential revelation of the New Testament, the essential revelation of the New Testament is the connection of kavod with the person of Jesus. That's why we saw his glory, the glory of an only begotten son. There is where there are, you know, theophoric, theophanic acts. There is God acting in history, not just in the giving of the law or the healing or the Mount Sinai or in Jesus. Jesus is the kavod. And his entrance marks a whole new way of looking at reality. Because God now, Immanuel, El is with us in a human being. So we saw his glory. huh? In John, to just conclude this quote, in John, the revelation of glory in the life of Jesus appears still more explicit. And especially in his death and resurrection, the kavod. God reveals himself in act. And the act is a saving act. All God's manifestations of glory are saving acts, you see. Um, now, there's another word that goes with that. Uh, and I owe this to um, um, uh, von Balthasar. Because he was the first that I know of. The other is this word momentum. See, once God acts in history, there's a momentum set up. It doesn't leave history. It reverberates. Much like a volcano, volcano erupts and its reverberations are felt. So what is liturgy? It's making present once again the kavod. That's why the kavod descends on the tent of meeting. And for us, the kavod, the kavod, is the Eucharist. If we could see what happens at the Eucharist, the Kavod Adonai, we would fall on our faces. There is God, God himself, the living, eternal word of God, the Kavod. And we saw his glory as of an only begotten son. He is there. And that's what we're talking about, you see. And so, the kavod's momentum is at every Eucharistic liturgy. It sets up a, a saving momentum. We have so much more to say about that, okay? Um, I'm trying to find uh, uh, some lines in here. Uh, I've already touched on this part. Huh? Uh, it belongs to this scandal of particularity. This bread and wine and that bread and wine, okay? Okay. Uh, See, God's gift of water, you see, is now also a blessing, you see. Uh, and so, uh, I, I just want to uh, read, well, I have so much to do. Let me just read a little bit. Uh, this is from St. Uh, this, I'm sorry, this is from St. Thomas Aquinas. It must be said that the Holy Fathers, I quoted this vaguely last week, it must be said that the Holy Fathers, see what he says? Patre Santi, who? Abraham, Moses, all the holy Jewish people, they are the Santi Patres, our Holy Fathers, you see? 
did not stop at the sacraments of the law as mere things. It wasn't just liturgy, you know. We still have litanics. It's just liturgy. No, no, no. Of course, now it's even fulfilled. But as images and shadows of future realities, they lived by faith. They knew there was more. You see? Okay. For the movement toward an image, insofar as it is an image, is the same as the movement toward the reality. As the philosopher says, that's the philosopher, for Aquinas is always Aristotle, you see, in his study on memory and recall. The movement toward the reality, you see, the movement toward the image is the same as the movement toward the reality. And therefore, the ancient fathers, our fathers, by observing the sacraments of the law, were brought toward Christ through the same faith and love by which we are still brought toward him. They had different signs. We have the fulfillment of those signs. But even in that state, for those who had faith, you see, for this reason, the ancient fathers of the church belonged to the same body of the church to which we belong. Augustine said the same thing. Uh, don't think, brethren, that uh, all the just who went through persecution by the, by the evil ones and even those who came before the coming of the Lord, uh, pronouncing the... Uh, coming of the Lord, don't think that they did not belong to the members of Christ. Let it be. Huh? Let it never happen. Let it never be thought, opposite, that they did not belong to the members of Christ who belong to the city whose king is Christ. Isn't that a different view of the Jewish people? As Pope uh, John Paul used to say, you see, you're my older brothers. Now, what we have, in, have inherited, what we've been given, you see, is not the uh, shadow. It's the imago. It's the image. Or, literally, I'm, I'm quoting a text in right now in Hebrews 10.1. You see, the law having a shadow, a skia of the good things to come. What are the good things to come? Heaven. But not, you see, have the good things to come and not an icon. We have the good things to come, but we're not in heaven either. We're on another stage of this. We have the icon of the very realities. The shadow believed in brings you, but the icon brings you there much more powerfully. And that is the Eucharist. It's the whole sacramental system, but it's the Eucharist, you see? And so, that's the icon. We live in the era of icon. When we celebrate the Eucharist, we have the reality itself there. The body and blood, we have Jesus Christ present with us. But you see, the what, what makes it an icon is, it is the fullness of Jesus. He's just as really there as in heaven. Just as really there as in heaven. But he's not there under the form of the reality that he has in heaven. There, he has a radiant humanity, still with his wounds. And the saints and angels around him, loving him, praising him, worshiping him, and him bestowing love on them. That's the normal state of Jesus, if you will. The sacramental state is ours until we see him.